it was tearing, tearing me apart last night and I needed that I needed that last night and for that for nobody to be here last night and to go into their rooms and not and know that I wasn't going to turn the rain machines on and I know that I wasn't going to turn their monitor on On August 13th, 2018, Chris Watts annihilated his entire family. He killed his wife, Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and his unborn child, Nico. So let's go ahead and sit back and investigate, grab a snack or a hot drink. Um, we definitely have a lot to go through. And before I jump in, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps me out a lot. And also hit that like button at the end if you enjoyed this video. Except, well, one thing led to another and eight years later, we have two kids. We live in Colorado and he's the best thing that has ever happened to me. Chris Watts was born on May 16th, 1985 in Spring Lake, North Carolina. His parents are Cindy and Ronnie, and he also has an older sister, Jamie Watts. And Chris was very close with his father, not so much his mother, but him and his father had an extremely tight bond. Chris was often described as a quiet, shy person, didn't say very much, kept to themselves. Um, he was very, very close with his father. They often went to like NASCAR races and things like that. But that was about it. He was very quiet, very shy. And as you will see as we go on, that's going to be a reoccurring theme throughout Chris's life. In May 2003, Chris graduated from Pine Forest High School, and he actually went on to attend the NASCAR Technical Institute in Mooresville, North Carolina. This was really hard on Chris's family, especially his father. His father actually fell into cocaine addiction uh, during this time because he was just so sad. Chris was like his best friend and they were very, very close. And, um, you know, once Chris found out about it, his mom like confronted him and let him know. And Chris actually staged an intervention for his father and he dropped the drug quickly and like never tried it again. Chris graduated from the NASCAR Technical Institute in 2006, and he had an interview with the company, but he only had one interview and was never called back. To Chris, this was his first big letdown as an adult. As everybody says about him, Chris never complained about anything, and he just went with the flow of whatever happened in his life, and he ended up taking a job at Ford as a service technician. He briefly dated a woman that was going through a divorce, but it ended up just not working out, and he was given the name Shanann Rusek by his cousin Nicole Kanandi. I'm really bad at pronouncing names, but his cousin Nicole basically worked with Shanann, and she thought that they may be a good match. Shanann Rusek was born January 10th, 1984 in Pasick, New Jersey. Her parents are Sandy and Frank, and she also has a younger brother named Frankie. Although Shanann was often sick as a young child, her family said that she had a very vibrant personality and she really lit up the room. Shanann's family moved a few times uh, while they were young, while the children were young, but they ended up in Aberdeen, North Carolina, and Shanann ended up going to Pinecrest High School. Shanann really started to find her way in the world when she attended drama classes. She really loved it. She was a stage manager and the students that knew her then and the teachers that knew her then said that this was so much fun for her she you know really enjoyed setting up the stages and painting and getting everything organized this is where shanann really loved uh realized that she loved like organizing and setting everything up and in a way kind of like being the boss a little bit uh this is something that she really enjoyed a lot and really um helped bring her out of her shell and helped her like realize the type of person she was after high school, Shanann married her high school sweetheart, Leonard King. She later said that the relationship was bad and they were only married for a couple years. 
In 2006, Shanann became the store manager of a cell phone shop and the owners opened a automotive, like a custom auto shop. And Shanann actually became the bookkeeper as a, of that place as well. So she actually was like, you know, having two jobs at the same time. She was working her butt off. She worked all the time. She ended up saving a ton of money and was able to build a house from the ground up when she was 25. In November 2009, Shanann ended up building a $309,000 mansion on 1000 Peninsula Street in Lake Wiley, North Carolina. She wanted to, you know, build this really beautiful home and get it furnished and, you know, painted and really done up nice on the inside and sell it to make a profit later on. Shanann moved into the home and she started having a lot of health problems. Her hair was falling out. She was losing a lot of weight. She was just feeling really terrible. And she ended up basically dragging herself to the doctor. And she found out that she had lupus. And she found that out in 2010. I'm assuming that she had to take a lot of like medical tests and things like that. And, um, you know, really come to the root cause of what her problem was and she got on a medication regimen and she was able to control it a lot more even though lupus is very painful and it's something that you're going to have flare-ups throughout your life. In July of 2010, Shanann messaged Chris Watts back on Facebook. They seem to have a little bit of a rocky start. Um, they didn't have like a ton of chemistry right off the bat. I think that just by like reading source material and things like that, I really feel like Shanann thought that Chris was like too quiet and you know she's very outgoing and has a very you know vibrant personality and so she just didn't click with him right away but she did give him a couple of chances and they actually went on a small trip together to Myrtle Beach and this is when Shanann said she fell in love with Chris. She had a really bad lupus flare-up and he actually let her rest her head in his lap for like three hours and um, you know she just really appreciated that and loved that he did that for her. A few months later, Chris moved into the mansion with Shanann for a while while they were getting it set up to sell, and they actually had a cookout to introduce both sets of the family. They invited everybody over, they were going to have like a barbecue, and Shanann's family immediately realized that Chris's family did not like Shanann. They were being a little bit nosy, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, they were being a little bit nosy about the fact that Shanann had this huge home and they were like wondering like how could she possibly have that much money and this and that and not realizing that Shanann worked her butt off for a long time at two jobs full time, you know, to pay for this. She really worked hard for this home and she did it to set herself up for her future. And Chris also had a, you know, okay sized amount of money saved up and they were both putting money into it to fix it up. They furnished the house and everything, but the families immediately did not get along. And this is like the first time that we see the setup of what goes on to be like a problem throughout the marriage. We see that, um, you know, the families just like did not get along. And we see that um, this is like the day that started it because Chris's family was making it really obvious and pointing out that Shanann had previously been married and, you know, just kind of like being a little bit nosy. So the Wattses made it very obvious that they did not care for Shanann right away. For the next few years, they saw Chris's family less and less. They spent most holidays with Shanann's family and the Wattses even dug themselves in a deeper hole by not sending out invitations for the wedding. It was his sister Jamie's job and she said she did it, but a whole bunch of people did not come to their wedding. Um, so they think that, you know, maybe her and Cindy didn't do it on purpose. Shanann actually got the idea that the couple should move to Colorado because the air is really fresh there. A lot of people move there for health reasons and friends suggested to her that that may be a really great place to move to help with her lupus. You know, it's a lot of a healthier place to be. There's not so much um, gas and smoke and, you know, it's just a lot um, better and healthier of a place to be for Shanann since she did have her lupus. So Chris ended up moving to Colorado, uh, Broomfield, Colorado in 2012 with the Dietzes. And this were people that were like Shanann's friend previously. And 
Shanann ended up moving there a few months later. She stayed back home to um, finish trying to sell her home. It's also beneficial, I feel like, to point that the Wattses didn't attend neither Shanann's engagement party or their wedding. The only person that attended their wedding was Chris's grandmother. Chris ended up finding a job at Logmont Ford, and a few months later when Shanann ended up moving to Colorado to be with him, she found a job there too as a sales representative. So they were both working at the same place, uh, both doing really well, bringing in a lot of money. Co-workers there would state that Chris would hand Shanann his entire paycheck and that she covered the finances for both of them. Over the next few years, the couple would end up racking up a tremendous amount of debt, especially when their daughter Bella was born on December 17, 2013. By the time Bella was born, she already had an entire closet filled with, to the brim with clothes and shoes, and her bedding on her um, nursery was like very fancy, and she had a very expensive crib. The nursery was like very top of the line very expensive and the family just continued to rack up more and more debt and shortly after Bella was born they actually got a new car as well. They ended up having a car note that was about $600 a month and their rent was almost $3,000 a month. Shanann's family and friends have said that Shanann wanted the best of everything. She wanted you know the most expensive, the best looking version of whatever you can get and so you know, that comes up to a cost and they were quickly spending more money than they could possibly pay back. Not too long later, they had another daughter named Celeste on July 17th, 2015. Over the next few years, things seemed to be going very well for the family. They often would say that they were a great couple and that Shanann was a great mother and Chris was a great father. And their friends also said that Shanann was very dominant, but Chris was happy to do whatever she wanted. The couple ended up declaring bankruptcy uh, within the next few years because of the tremendous amount of debt they were in. And Shanann was working at a hospital and just working really late at night and taking care of the kids during the day. And she became very tired of it. She you wanted to spend more time with her family. That was the most important thing to her. So she actually started working for a company called Lavelle and she ended up being a Thrive sales promoter. And this is when Chris started working for Anadarko Petroleum. Shannon thrived, no pun intended, um, at working for Lavelle. She sold a ton of products. She won several awards within the company. She had so many people signed up beneath her, especially Chris. He was signed up and he, um, you know, sold a lot, but many people felt like Shanann was the one actually selling the products for him, which I could totally see, right? Um, but she was always, you know, on Facebook promoting the product every single day. Um, many people said that they actually unfriended Shanann even though they really liked her because she was constantly on Facebook and they were constantly getting notifications that she was making posts about Thrive, that she was on live. So she was always on there. Her entire life was on Facebook and many of these videos where she's promoting and talking about her family, they're still on Facebook where you can watch them. And it's believed that Shanann was like at the top of the Thrive like, you know, pyramid. It's kind of like a MLM pyramid scheme, if you will, kind of thing. So the more people that you sign on beneath you, the more money you make. And at one point, Shanann was making a really good amount of money, um, about sixty to $70,000 a year selling these products. And she actually got Chris hooked on these patches. Chris kind of was like, just an average looking guy. He kind of had like that dad bod going on a little bit chubby and he started taking these Thrive patches and he started feeling really good and exercising and he actually went from looking just like an average looking kind of everyday guy and 
he started looking really buff and looking really good. It really like enhanced his appearance and it really helped Shanann as well because like I said, she struggled with lupus and often wasn't feeling very good. And these Thrive patches really helped her. She felt full of energy. She looked like she kind of had a glow up as well, maybe lost a little bit of weight or toned up. And you could just tell that they were both feeling really good and feeling healthy. Shanann was doing so well, in fact, that she ended up winning a car for her, and Chris also won a car, but again, it is believed that Shanann was basically doing all of Chris's work within the company, and they both won a car. They won several vacations that they went on with Thrive, and she would often talk about these vacations on her Facebook Live and, you know, try to get people to come to the company because you win all these awesome vacations, and so Shanann was quickly a rising star in this company. On August 3rd, 2017, a woman named Nicole Kessinger googled Chris Watts, and then she googled Shanann Watts. Chris met Nicole at Anadarko. She had just started working there, and they ended up chit-chatting a little bit through the Anadarko um, work emails, and then they actually went to using texting and private emails shortly after. Chris told Shanann that he wanted another child, although later on he denies that and said it was Shanann's idea. And on May 29th, they actually posted this video to Facebook and it made a lot of people really uncomfortable to see how Chris reacted to Shanann announcing that she was pregnant. <laughs> I like that shirt. In June, Shanann decided that she wanted to take a six-week vacation with her family to go to North Carolina and visit, you know, her parents and her brother. She also agreed to see the Wattses, to let the grandchildren see the Wattses, uh, because they really didn't spend that much time with them. A couple times a year, they maybe saw them, but it really wasn't that much. And it ended up where Chris stayed home because he had to work, um, but he ended up going to North Carolina the fifth week. So he spent the last week there with his family. After Chris took his family to the airport, he immediately called Nicole to find out when they could meet up for the first time outside of work. Over the next five weeks, Chris became increasingly distant to Shanann. He would go without answering his phone at all. He wouldn't text back. And if he did end up answering, he would act extremely aggravated and just tell Shanann, like, I'm busy, I'm working, I'm sleeping. But then sometimes he would, like, call her boo and, like, say, I'm really sorry. So his, you know, his characteristics during this time were very odd. His switch in personalities was really uncomfortable because sometimes he would be really rude and nasty and other times he would be um, trying to act like nothing was wrong. He spent most of his time on his family's trip with Nicole. They went camping, they did all kinds of stuff together, they went uh, sandboarding I believe it's called, they did all kinds of things together. They apparently had sex multiple times a day while they were gone, and he spent a ton of time with Nicole while his family was away, and that's why he was not responding to Shanann, because every time she called him, he was with Nicole. Shanann spent the last few months of her life under a tremendous amount of stress, because her husband was acting so different, seemingly out of nowhere. During the trip, Shanann visited the Wattses. She took her grandchildren to see Cindy and Ronnie. And before they even got there, she let them know Celeste was extremely allergic to nuts. She couldn't even be around them, apparently. And so she said, please, like, remove all the nuts from your house, which her parents did, no problem. But allegedly, Cindy left a bag of like pecans or something or pistachios 
um, at a really low shelf where Celeste could have easily grabbed them. And then one day when uh, Chris's sister Jamie brought her children over, they all had some ice cream and the child that was sitting right next to Celeste had a big bowl of ice cream that allegedly contained nuts, even though Cindy denies this. And later on, Cindy said to Shanann and Chris, well, this is going to teach Celeste that she can't ever always have everything her way that if somebody next to her is having ice cream with nuts in it that she just has to deal with it basically and to an extent i see what she means but also celeste was super young she was like two or three at this point very very young and that's like completely different like if you have an extreme allergy where you can't be around something that's a bigger deal than well, I just can't have it because I said no. Like, that's just completely ridiculous. And that's really, in my opinion, pretty cold, uh, like a cold way to treat your granddaughter, right? While she was away, Shanann was messaging friends and talking to many of her friends about how she was really stressed that Chris was acting weird. She, you know, said that he was being very distant and not talking and being very rude to her. And it made her feel very sad and uncomfortable. And while she was, you know, trying to find out what exactly was wrong with her marriage, Chris was writing love letters to Nicole and sending, um, you know, birthday cards and all of these love letters to Nicole. It was time for Chris to come to North Carolina. Her family immediately noticed that Chris was different. He was being very distant and very cold to Shanann. He was not being as sweet and loving as he was to his children. He was like shouting at them more and being more like aggressive with them than he ever was. And during this time, he often went out on his own accord, like all by himself going out on these really long walks. He would leave and like go to like stores or like the mall by himself. He even left out at one point and was looking for a necklace for Nicole Kessinger. Chris left one day he went on a walk for almost two hours and was talking to Nicole on the phone after this phone call Nicole was googling wedding dresses and during this time they were also sending each other nudes and Chris actually had a secret app on his phone that I believe was a calculator I've heard it's a few different things but I'm pretty sure it was a calculator and or it looked like a calculator and Chris was like hiding all of these nudes and all of these like sexy pictures that Nicole was sending him during this week's stay where Chris was with his family Shanann started feeling terrible she started throwing up all the time she was feeling absolutely miserable and later Chris stated that he gave Shanann oxycodone I believe it's pronounced and he was trying to make Shanann have a miscarriage after the family returned back to Colorado Shanann tried to initiate intimacy with Chris and he kept turning her down and he just basically was very cold with her and even on this like first night back Shanann tried she like made it really obvious that she wanted um, to have sex with Chris and she texted her friend that he was doing a push-up challenge instead and he decided that he was like going to sleep in the basement I guess and the next day Chris went back to work and once he got off work that day he went straight to Nicole's house and they had sex and he told Nicole that the marriage was over that there was no way him and Shanann would ever get back together Shortly after, Shanann had a business trip with Thrive to Scottsdale, Arizona that she had won, and Shanann was not really wanting to leave because she knew that she wanted to work on the relationship with Chris, but in order to keep up with the company, and it looked really bad to not go, with these companies, it's very like, it's like a lot of pressure to attend all of these events and show off what you have because they want more people to sign up for these companies. So Shanann felt very pressured to go, even though she didn't want to. And she asked Chris to stay home and basically get Bella ready because this coming Monday, she was supposed to start kindergarten. She expressed to Chris that she really wanted the relationship to work and that she was willing to change to make him happy. She realized that maybe sometimes she was too bossy and they, you know, she really wanted their relationship to work out. 
So Shanann actually ordered like a marriage um, repair book, a marriage counseling book for both of them. Hers was on an ebook so she could read it on her trip. And she actually had Chris um, sent a physical copy from Amazon in the mail that he would receive in the next day or so. And according to text messages from Shanann that she, you know, later talked to her friends about this, that Chris was cold, but he was a little bit better than before. Um, not really talking much, just kind of like agreeing to whatever Shanann wanted to do. And Shanann actually wrote him like a really nice love letter and told Chris how she felt about him and that she wanted the relationship to work. She left it on the counter for him when she went to the airport and she asked that he write her a letter as well. The night Shanann left for her work trip, Chris decided that he couldn't stay away from Nicole and he arranged for a young lady named McKenna to babysit for the family. They were a family friend's daughter and she ended up coming over to babysit the girls. And once Chris arrived to Nicole's house, they had sex. She weighed him. She noticed he had lost quite a bit more weight. He was down to 180 and they went out to eat. And with this meal, for the first time, Chris paid with his joint bank account with Shanann, with that debit card that Shanann would see exactly what he bought. And the alert was sent to Shanann's phone and she asked him like, well, what did you get? And it was at a local restaurant that they knew about, they had been to before. And she knew that a meal for one person would not cost almost $70. And so she asked Chris to save the receipt. After they finished their meal, Chris and Nicole had sex again and he apologized to her because the babysitter couldn't do overnights, which I just thought, I just thought that that was so crazy when I read that because I could just imagine Chris asking a young girl who's like, you know, probably middle school, high school age to stay overnight. Like that just seems really weird. My mom, when I was that age, would have never let me stay at someone's house overnight to babysit. Okay. Like I just thought that that was really weird. And it totally seems like something he would do because he was um, very desperate for Nicole's attention. Shanann was feeling really terrible on her trip. She barely ate or drank anything all weekend. She spent most of the time in her hotel room reading her like marriage counseling book and, you know, writing rough drafts for notes to give to Chris a love letter just to, you know, express the way she felt and how she wanted to change and how she wanted to mend the relationship. And we think that she was feeling so ill. Doctors and investigators think she... Um, felt so ill because of the drug that Chris gave her. During this weekend, Chris volunteered to go to work early on Monday. The Anadarko oil site called Survey 319 was having a leakage problem and so the supervisor sent out a text seeing who would be able to go and check it out early and Chris volunteered to do so. And this is when investigators thought that he may have already known in his mind what he was going to do because he was having excuses to be at the site alone. Shanann arrived back home on Monday, August 13th at around 1.30 to 2 a.m. She was up for a little bit before she went to bed and Chris said at this point they had sex and went back to sleep. And Chris woke up a few hours later to pack his lunch and have a hard conversation with Shanann about separating. When Chris went back up to the bedroom to talk to Shanann about um, separating and getting a divorce, he said Shanann confronted him about cheating and told him he would never see his children again. Now, Chris then says that he straddled Shanann and started choking her. It took about two to four minutes for Shanann to finally die and she didn't fight. They think that she was in a state of shock seeing her, you know, loving husband of all of these years strangle her to death. And she basically just had mascara, you know, tears running down her face and she ended up passing away. Her eyes were bloodshot and she didn't fight at all. 
Bella then heard what was going on. She woke up from all the commotion and she started asking him like, what's wrong with mommy? What's going on? And, you know, she was old enough to be slightly aware of what was happening. She may not have fully like understood death or anything like that because she was so young, but she knew something was wrong. And Chris ended up wrapping Shanann up in a bed sheet and dragging her down to the basement to put trash bags over her. At 5.17 a.m., Chris backed his Anadarko work truck into the garage and put Shanann's body in the floorboard of the back seat. He then went back upstairs and Celeste was already awake. Bella had woke her up as well and he put both of the girls without a car seat in the back of his truck with their mother's body below her feet. They took about a 40 minute drive to Survey 319. He then took Shannon's body out of the trash bags and the sheet and buried her in a shallow grave. Chris saw that Shannon had had a miscarriage and they recently just announced to their friends and family that they were gonna name their baby Nico. Chris then smothered Celeste with a blanket and carried her up to one of the oil tanks and put her inside of it. He did the same thing to Bella. Bella fought hard for her death, harder than her mother or Celeste, who was just a young baby and she didn't know. And Bella actually burst her frenulum by trying to get away and she bit her tongue several times and it's thought that Bella's death was extremely violent. He then had the nerve to text Shanann's phone and say, if you're gonna take the girls anywhere today, let me know. He then texted Bella's new school that she was going to be going to and basically unenrolled her and said that they were moving. And he called his realtor to talk about starting to sell their home. And he told his realtor that him and Shanann were gonna get a divorce. He also started receiving texts from Nicole Adkinson, who was Shanann's friend that drove her home from the airport that night. And she was very worried because Shanann didn't go to her doctor's appointment and she wasn't answering the phone. And so Chris was basically telling both of them that Shanann said she was going to go to a friend's house and she was going to go have a play date with the kids. So he didn't know where they were. At around noon, Nicole Atkinson went to the Watts' house uh, because Chris was basically saying he couldn't come home from work and he was just sure that Shanann was like out with the kids when he knew very well exactly where they were and he was basically refusing to come home. So Nicole started doing some digging of her own. She noticed that Shanann's car was still there with the car seats in it and she saw Shanann's sandals laying by the front door and she knew that Shanann wore these sandals every single day and that she would be wearing them if she went somewhere. So she was worried that Shanann may have, you know, passed out or something like that. So about an hour goes by as she is still trying to contact Chris, trying to get the key code to the garage to go inside and he keeps saying no. Um, she ends up calling the police. While the officer was looking around the house, their neighbor Nate actually approached the officer to ask what was wrong, if everything was okay, and he actually let the officer know that he had a security camera on the front of his home that actually showed some of the garage, some of the outside of the Watts' home, and so he actually left to go and, you know, get that ready, and I'm assuming, like, pull up the footage. So while he was doing that, the officer actually asked Nicole Atkinson to call Chris for the keypad to the garage. She was trying to get permission uh, because at this point they just thought maybe Shanann was sick. So nobody knew, but Chris did, right? Um, so they are trying to just get into the house. Chris says he's five minutes away and he doesn't want police to like break down the door. Chris told his boss that he was leaving the site and he basically was like, something's wrong at home. And he was just very calm about it. He didn't seem in a panic. Before he left, he went over by one of the oil tanks to use the washroom, I guess. And they feel that he was trying to get rid of evidence at this point. Chris didn't arrive home until 2.07 p.m. 
And the reason why it took him so long to take about a 40 minute trip was because he stopped and took off his murder outfit at a construction site and put on a new set of clothes. And on the way back, he stopped at a gas station to get snacks and to flirt with the woman at the gas station. When Chris arrived at the home, he greeted the officer and he went to check the inside of the house first. And after a few minutes, he came back and the officer, you know, was let inside and he started searching the home. Shortly after, Chris found Shanann's phone, he found her wedding ring, and he found medication that her and the children would have to take because her and the children both had quite a few medical issues. And Nicole Atkinson immediately knew that this was an issue because Shanann was always on her phone promoting for Thrive and she would absolutely never leave home without her children's medication or her own. When they were checking the home, Nicole noticed that on Chris and Shanann's bed that the bedding was all like bunched up and on the floor. And so she right away knew that something was off because Shanann was an extremely neat and tidy person and she knew that Shanann would never leave the house that way with her bedding just strewn everywhere. At this point their neighbor Nate had the security cam footage up. He first pulled up the footage of Chris backing his truck into the garage and Chris said that he was putting water jugs in his car and tools and a bug bag. I'm not quite sure what that is, but he just made it seem like he was loading up all of his things he needed for work. And then they also showed the footage of Shanann entering the home at 1.48 a.m. after her trip, and this was the only time that anyone had accessed the home. Once Chris left Nate's house and went back to his own home, he had this to say about Chris. At 2.35 p.m., Detective Baumhover arrived to the home and he started investigating and basically checking the whole house again and, you know, was questioning Chris and Nicole about what was going on with Shanann and the kids. And at 3.45 p.m., Chris called Nicole Kessinger to let her know that his family was missing. At this point in the day, Shanann's family and friends started making pleas on Facebook that whoever had her, if Shanann was upset and was just gone, whatever was going on to please come home. If somebody had her, please bring her back. They just wanted her to return home safely. The next day, police brought cadaver dogs to start searching the property and the surrounding areas. And police told Chris that the dogs would have to sniff out some of Shanann and the children's worn clothing to get their proper scent and police feel that he tampered with the evidence because he washed all of the clothes in the house. He washed everything. And so there was nothing for them to smell to get their fresh scent. And Chris also did three interviews during this time. And Chris looks so uncomfortable. Like every time the dog like barks or makes a noise because it's like going on in the background, Chris like makes like a weird, you know, motion and he just is looking so uncomfortable like he's thinking any second they're gonna find out what I did and he is on these you know interviews just boohooing it up and you know making it seem like he loves his family so much but he's saying it all in a very like deadpan way so it's just very uncomfortable to watch especially since we know exactly what he did maybe at the time when we didn't know what was going on it may have been a little bit different but now knowing exactly what he did, it's really like horrifying because he's just lying and police set it up separately uh, to try to see if Chris was lying because he was telling a lot of people different things that he, you know, he didn't know where Shanann was and that he thinks she left in the middle of the night and he told someone else that she may have left in the morning. So they were trying to see if Chris could get his story straight to three different news stations, and of course he didn't. 
On the 14th and 15th of August, Chris was interrogated and polygraphed by police. And at this time, he was very adamant that he had no idea where Shanann was and that he would never do anything to hurt them. They also noticed that in the past couple years, Chris had lost a really big amount of weight and he was looking, you know, like really good. And they asked if he was having an affair. He said no. Chris agreed to take his polygraph on August 15th. His father actually was there at the police station with him because his father had flown in to be with Chris during this time. Chris did not want his mother to be there. And during this time, there was a forensic sweep of the Watts' home. That day, Chris met FBI agent Tammy Lee, who gave him his polygraph test. Tammy, did you meet Tammy yesterday? No, I don't know what is Tammy. Hi, Chris, how are you? All right, so then when we're done, we'll, um, we'll figure out our game plan that I was talking about today. Um, right. They asked me if I would uh, be willing to come here and chat with you and, and hopefully get you cleared up and, and on your way, because okay. it sounds like that's what you're here for, and, and yeah, that's um, awesome, because that's mostly what people want to do, is like, dude, you're going to feel you're the wrong person? Like, I just want to show you I had nothing to do with this, and then you guys can get on your way and, yeah. you know, do your investigation somewhere else. Because so, okay. that, that helps us, because then we don't have to keep focusing on Chris. Does that make sense? Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, this polygraph today is going to be recorded. Okay. Obviously, it would be dumb if I didn't, because what if at the end I said, you said whatever, and you really didn't say it? Obviously, they could go back and look at the recording. Uh, there's a camera right there. And there's also a backup digital recording that I'm doing. Chris obviously did not pass this polygraph test and he seemed very confident that he would so they started interrogating him to find out what was going on what exactly he knew and he said that he wanted to talk to his father chris told his father that shanann killed the kids and that he got in a rage that something just came over him and he then strangled shanann and at this point chris divulges where he put their bodies, they had like a surveillance map of Survey 319 and Chris basically like circled where exactly they were. On that same day in the morning, Anadarko security office called the police and let them know that Chris was having a romantic relationship with a woman named Nicole Kessinger. And later on that day, Nicole actually called police herself to let them know that she had her full cooperation. Nicole had a few interviews with the FBI. She was never polygraphed, but they basically ruled her out. They said that, you know, maybe Chris was inspired to kill his family because, you know, he was so in love with her and he just wanted to get rid of his family. But they felt that you couldn't blame Nicole for that because she wasn't, you know, there doing, you know, the murders with him and that she didn't directly tell him to do it supposedly and it's just really frustrating because after these interviews she came home and googled do people like amber frey do you know did people read amber frey's book which of course is scott peterson's um mistress who is it's a completely different situation because amber frey absolutely did not know about lacy she was told scott was single that he was divorced he had completely moved on and that's like a completely different thing. So I don't even understand why she would Google that because she knew that Shanann was pregnant because she told Chris in, you know, like a text message that she wanted to give him his first son. And so people were very frustrated with the fact that Nicole never, you know, was more looked into than what she was. On August 15th, Chris Watts was arrested and Shanann's body was recovered that evening and she was pronounced dead at 12.05 a.m. Next day, the FBI and the Anadarko safety team arrived at Survey 319 to recover the bodies of Celeste and Bella. Celeste was pronounced dead at 3.40 p.m. and Bella at 5.50 p.m. Their bodies were in terrible condition when they pulled them out of those tanks. Um, a few pieces of skin had been pulled off, hair was at the top of the opening, uh, I believe it was Bella's hair was at the top, um, 
they had a lot of skin slippage due to being in the oil for so long and their bodies were just in absolutely terrible condition and they had to be transported in a particular manner because they were highly flammable. And actually for their funeral, they had to have special coffins made to make sure there was no oil leakage into the environment and their bodies wouldn't you know, catch on fire. On September 1st, Shanann's family held a funeral for Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and Nico and the Watts did not attend. They decided to have their own funeral on October 27th. Chris Watts is a totally disgusting person and since this he has changed his story a few times. He has now said that he killed the children before Shanann came home. He thought they were dead and he killed Shanann and then the children woke up and then he killed them again at the site. So he's changed his story several times and he's just an absolutely like disgusting person and I can't even imagine what Shanann felt seeing the person that she loved strangle her to death and to be wondering at that time like what's going to happen to my kids what's going on like she was in complete shock and I can't even imagine what his daughters went through you know they loved their father they were good to him and he just completely did not care and I just find it very frustrating this case is so sad and I just feel so terrible for Shanann's family and her friends and they all really loved her and she just seemed like so many people really cared about her and loved her and it was just so sad to see this happen and unfortunately Chris has a lot of fans and a lot of women really like him and I'm just assuming because he's like a good-looking guy and you know people are turned on by killers for some reason and a lot of people really defend Chris and say that he was pushed into a plea deal to admit that he killed all three uh, because he ended up um, receiving three no five life sentences I'm sorry for um, killing his family and so he has no chance of parole but a lot of people say that the original story is true and that Shanann was super mean to him and he just couldn't stand it anymore and he blew up and even if that was the case if Shanann was so terrible to him and mean and they were just in a bad marriage that's not a good enough reason to kill somebody I'm sorry it's just not and if you think that then you have some serious problems what would the world look like if we all killed somebody who was mean to us if every single person was able to kill somebody how many times have you been that person that you were being mean to somebody it happens and people pick apart her Facebook and say like oh well look at how mean she was to her children in this and look at how mean she was to Chris and like if we looked at ourselves and saw how sometimes we treat our people and our family and our friends we would be disgusted with ourselves because sometimes yeah we are really short with the people we care about and sometimes we may say some things that aren't always the best or we may come off as being rude in front of other people it just happens nobody's perfect and so to act as if Shanann deserved to die because she wasn't always nice to Chris is completely ridiculous and I think that that's absolutely terrible that people even say that that's okay and apparently as of late when I was researching this video and getting it all together Nicole Kessinger apparently has changed her name and she has reached out to Chris in prison even though they are under like a no contact order and so she apparently like sent him a letter so now his mail is being more strictly guarded than what it was but he is basically free to talk to his family he you know gets snacks at the um, commissary and he watches TV and plays basketball which I think is disgusting I think that he needs to sit in like a cell all day and think about what he's done and I don't even think he deserves to have pictures of his family which apparently he does in his cell which I think is totally wrong I think that he should just have to sit there and stare at the wall and think about exactly what he did and me as well as I'm sure many of you out there hope that Chris Watts has a completely miserable life and never 
has one ounce of happiness because what he did is so disgusting and heartless and sad and it's just terrible and the fact that he told his family towards the end that he will basically take what happened with him to the grave he's never going to say exactly what happened but he planted it in everyone's mind in the beginning that Shanann killed her children first which I absolutely do not believe that um, he planted it there first and so he made a lot of people think that and so a lot of people really believe him and his mother continues to advocate for him which okay lady like your son killed somebody three people your grandchildren which I'd be scared to be around him frankly but you know to each their own I guess thank you so much for checking out this video I really appreciate it if there are any other updates on this case at some point I will definitely do a new video I will you know continue to talk about it if anything else you know does come out at any time right so thank you so much guys for watching if you ever have any cases that you would like me to cover please leave me a comment down below and I hope you all have a beautiful day and stay safe out there bye bye